Hello, folks. Welcome to this week's episode of Catholic Recon, Testimonies from Reverts and Converts. Before I introduce my guest, my very special guest, I want to remind you to subscribe to my channel if you like this content. Uh, visit my website, eddytrask.com uh, forward slash sponsorship if you want to support the channel. And then also I want to remind you that these episodes will air every Tuesday at three o'clock Mountain Standard Time. So I have a very consistent uh, schedule here, which is great. We're very blessed to have that. And I just wanted to remind you so that you can uh, click the bell and also get reminders on YouTube. With that, my guest today is Father Drake McAllister. Welcome, Father. Thanks for having me, Eddie. I'm uh, delighted to be here from uh, sunny Steubenville, Ohio, which we are thrilled that it's in fact sunny today. It's mid 60s and uh, we are super thankful. It seems that uh, the snow is gone, at least for us. I don't know what it's like where you are. It's uh, perfect. The high is, I think, 55 here. So we're in good uh, shape. <laughs> so Father Drake, I heard about him through Mike Roberts, who was on the show about a month ago. And I'll let Father Drake explain the connection there. But Mike, immediately after we were done talking, he texted me and said, you've got to speak to Father Drake. You've got to reach out to him. And so he made the intro. And I am very appreciative of this opportunity. And I realized that Father Drake was also on the journey home with Marcus Grodi. I think it's great. There have been a few people already that have been on that show. It's great to get kind of the update. Some of these episodes aired 10, 15 years ago, and that work, I, it's invaluable. I just love that there's an opportunity to kind of get a refresher. So with that, Father Drake, the floor is yours. All right. Yeah, and that, that update is great because last time I was on Journey Home, I was not Father Drake. So I'll, I'll explain some of that story. So. Uh, so, all right, how did we get here? So, uh, so I'll, I'll tell just a, kind of the, the midpoint of the story, just so for as people are, are listening, they, they kind of know where it's heading. We uh, entered the Catholic Church in 2004, uh, and uh, I am a priest. I am married. I'm one of those rare married priests, a dispensational priest. I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, I do have uh, children. I had three children when we entered the Catholic Church. I uh, have two more now, so we have five. It's all girls, all girls all the time. Blessed am I among women, indeed. <laughs> and, um, and, and been here in Steubenville, Ohio uh, since about 2005. But uh, so let's back up the story a bit. I uh, grew up in California. We're, we're California natives, myself, my wife, my parents, her parents, and for many generations. And uh, I did not grow up in the Catholic Church. I grew up outside the Catholic Church in a Pentecostal denomination. And uh, the, the actual denomination is the International Church of the Four Square Gospel. And there's a lot of flavors of Pentecostal slash charismatic. It's largely an interchangeable term. Um, uh, some people will will draw swords over the distinctions, but uh, but Foursquare is what you would consider uh, part of the um, you know if you want to say OG charismatic Pentecostals. You know they're they're part of the historic groups that go back to the near beginning of the Pentecostal outpouring, uh, Zusa Street, nineteen oh six. You know them, Assembly of God, Church of God. There's a host of those groups in those early years. Uh, Foursquare in particular starts about. Um, in, you know, about a decade or so after that so-called initial outpouring. And so, so um, I grew up within Foursquare and it was uh, a really great place to be. Both my parents came from a Church of Christ background. So I don't know if you know or are familiar with Church of Christ at all. They're the, uh, they're the no instrument people. So, uh, you know, solid biblical literalists, and pretty strict biblical literalists, but um, and actually some of the most honest biblical literalists uh, that, that are out there in that they saw baptism, based on their study of scripture, baptism was necessary, communion should be the centerpiece of every Sunday service, and uh, what you believe and how you live matters. Um, but with that, you know, they, they grew up in a no instrument group because the nowhere in the New Testament is to say, pick up a guitar, play an instrument. It says sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, but 
Um, so they were always a cappella. So they, they grew up in that type of environment. So they had a deep love for the Lord, uh, a real strong appreciation for scripture, but they later came into to charismatic movement in the mid seventies, brought our family into that. Um, so I'm, I'm young, eight, nine years old when I enter into Foursquare at that point. Grew up in that denomination, was really a blessed time, engaging youth groups. Um, the the, the Foursquare, the reason why it has that name is it, it focuses on uh, four really uh, fundamental core doctrines. There's, there's more that they believe, but, but as far as a, uh, what's the lens at which we're operating, what's our mission? So uh four four key things the cross the cup the dove the crown four icons and jesus the savior the cross uh the cup jesus the healer and in particular physical healing um and you can ask questions later if you want more distinctions but uh you know the the, the, the pentecostals were making a real uphill battle against the reformed christians of centering around the gifts of the spirit does god still heal today as the prophetic gifts all those things john calvin specifically rejected all that said it ended with the death of john and so the reformers were pretty explicitly non-gift holy spirit you know god talking working so that's and stationism right just yes there yeah yes yeah absolutely and so so these early pentecostals are really fighting hard to um to reintroduce that to the Protestant Christian world. And um, uh, later there is, sorry, got a timer going off. Um, if I, uh, and I should get back to it, but there's a really fascinating link between the early church fathers and the early Pentecostal. So if I forget, re-ask me about that because it's really fascinating. Um, and um, so the cross, Jesus, the savior, the cup, Jesus the healer, uh, the dove, Jesus the baptizer in the Holy Spirit, because that was their focus, and the gifts of the Spirit, and then Jesus the soon and coming King. And so that, that really characterized kind of the thrust of the movement. And it's not bad. Jesus wants to save you. He wants to heal you. He wants to empower you with the Holy Spirit, and you better get on the stick now because he's coming back, so let's live for him. And that'll preach. You know, I mean, that's that's good stuff. There is nothing wrong with any of that. And, um, but within that environment, it was very much an evangelistic organization, very much that was the focus. And so uh, my parents, they were solid in the faith, really handed on a, a vibrant, a, a very active faith, not just in church, but they would take us to the mission and go help serve food on the weekend. We'd go, you know, sing songs for the, uh, the nursing homes or whatnot. And so, they really did their part to give us an active involved faith. So I grew up in that denomination and got out of high school, discerning Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? Uh, through a whole chain of events there, uh, intentional time of prayer and discernment. And the Lord uh, made it very clear. One of those, uh, as clear as it could be kind of moment without God talking out loud kind of moment that uh, he just made it uh, just explicit, Drake, you're to go into full-time ministry. Give me the rest of your life in service to me, and um, you'll get more later. So so I, uh, getting that uh, word from the Lord, went, uh, then enrolled in a, I was living in Fresno, California at the time, and low, enrolled in a local college there, a Christian college, to pursue uh, seminary effectively and uh, my, my ministry training. And had I been Catholic at the time, I would have entered the priesthood then, wasn't married, was unencumbered. The Lord had called me into service to him, but uh, that was not uh, my current family at the time. So entered into ministry and uh, it's, it's about a 13 year stint from my kind of initial step into ministry with youth ministry till by the time we exited and entered the Catholic church in 2004. So. We, uh, my wife, uh, so along this way, I finally do meet my now wife and, uh, what, what's unique about her, uh, her name is Crystal and she's a total gift and she had discerned a call as well to full-time ministry, but she knew that 
this full-time ministry would never be apart from her husband. And so, so she was very ministry. She was all in as well, mission-minded. And uh, in fact, when we went on our first date, she presumed it would be the last date because uh, not knowing what I wanted to do with my life. She finally asked the question, what do you want to do with your life? I said, well, God's called me to full-time ministry. And to the moment she's like, oh my goodness, <laughs> this one could be a keeper. And so uh, we entered into ministry. We had four years in Fresno, and then the Lord took us up to Seattle, Washington-ish. The, the, the next four years, we were about an hour north of Seattle, Washington. And then we eventually made our way down to Seattle proper, where a friend of ours was planting a church. Now, uh, and he's still a good friend, best friend of mine. And uh, he now pastors the flagship church down in Southern California. Well, what used to be one of the flagship churches. Uh, Jack Hayford was a well-known uh, preacher evangelist within Foursquare. So he pastors down there now. And, but he, uh, we, he had moved to Seattle and to establish a new congregation. We're talking about church planting and uh, within the denomination or most Christian groups, it just simply means where you go somewhere to establish a, a new congregation uh, in an area uh, for, based, you know, in your denomination where there isn't one previously. So there's plenty of other uh, Christian groups there, but not there was not a Foursquare church. So we went down in the University District of Seattle, and you go with a group of eight people, maybe 10, and you just start from scratch, and uh, you begin to uh, just outreach and grow the church from there. So it's, uh, yeah, it's it's quite an experience. It's it's a lot of work, and uh, Seattle, there was a, it's a, it's a ripe mission field. They need Jesus up there like, uh, like everywhere does, and so it's uh, it's here where the my my engagement with the Catholic Church uh, starts. So I finally have moved to the big city because where I was about an hour north, it was much smaller. And uh, so once we moved to Seattle, I thought, hey, I'm in the big city now. I wonder what uh, radio stations I can dial up and uh, that I couldn't get, you know, an hour away. So I start scanning the dial and and I come across something that sounds sounds. Christian-ish, religious, so, oh, let's listen to this. So I'm listening and listening and go, oh, wait a minute. I think these guys are Catholic. <laughs> I was like, who's ever heard of Catholic radio? So, because I don't run in Catholic circles at all. I mean, I'm about as far from Catholic as you could get as far as my knowledge of history, knowledge of ex exposure to literature. I never hung out with Lutherans or Methodists, you know, <laughs> I'd never, I'd never been to anything uh, like that at all. I wasn't particularly anti-Catholic. I wasn't raised anti-Catholic, but the, you know, the general presuppositions of, whew, man, it's a good thing we had that Reformation. Um, sure. You probably can know God as a Catholic, but it's just really hard. So it's a good thing we shed all that extra baggage so we can just, you know, really hone in on Jesus. Yeah. And uh, so I'm listening and man, these guys are Catholic. And, and, and it really honestly was a curiosity to me that there was Catholic radio. So I was just listening over the course of this hour. And, and the second thing that shocked me was these guys are unapologetically Catholic. Meaning they're like transubstantiation, we love it. And Mary, we love it. The Pope, woo. And and uh, I was like, man, these guys are full tilt. And um, but here is the next thing that struck me: these guys were charitable. They were Christ-centered. They were evangelistic. They knew their Bible, and they were Catholic. And, and I was like, wait a minute. I, you know, I, I've experienced all those other things, evangelistic, Christ-centered, you know, charitable, scripture. But it's like once you add Catholic to the mix, you know, the rest seemed to dissipate for some reason. <laughs> Had been my limited experience. that, and, and I got done with that hour and I thought, boy, it sounds like if I was to go hang out with Starbucks with these guys, we grabbed a coffee, that we might have some things in common, which was really weird. I just thought that. I, I, that was just strange to me. So, uh, so, so this is my introduction to Catholicism. Literally, this is I. I learned more about Catholicism in that hour, and it was all wrong. I disagreed with it all because by its, by default it's wrong because it's Catholic, and uh, uh, and I literally tuned back in the next day or the next day or two, 
for one reason only. Just, I was curious, are, are these the only excited Catholics on the planet or are there more of these people? <laughs> so the content wasn't compelling. Uh, the doctrine wasn't interesting. So I was not drawn back at all at this point for pursuit of truth or that what they said piqued my interest. Um, they were engaging and they sounded like, hmm, these are guys that, uh, boy, it'd be interesting if there's more of these guys out there. So, um, so I began to just tune in and listen on a regular basis and um, over the weeks. And like many other stories from guys like myself and backgrounds like myself, you begin just to get introduced to all kinds of things. Now, <clears throat> being a pastor, I, I always was careful to, uh, to study well and to represent honestly anything I disagreed with. Um, in fact, I, I really saw that, you know, context was a huge thing. Nothing would drive me nuts more than you go to, uh, you know, some church and you hear somebody preach some sermon, you know, he's preaching on the woman at the well. And, uh, you know, so then he gets an, he gets a, an hour of mileage out of, you know, she came out of the house. If you don't get out of the house, you're never going to find Jesus. And, you know, you just, it's like, it's an hour on that. You got out of the, and it's like, okay, there's, there's more going on here than, than, <laughs> than that aspect there. And, um, so context was an important thing for me. Uh, when, when Mormons would come knocking on my door, uh, I'd invite them in every time. And I'd invite them back as many weeks as they could stand it until they got sick of coming. And I would use this as an opportunity to ask them questions, sure. to learn about how they understood Christianity, instead of just starting with opposition or Jehovah's Witness would come to the door, come on in. And, uh, and I would work you know, my, my, my mode of operation was for us to have a real conversation. I should be able to articulate to you what you believe in such a way that you go, amen. Okay. Cause once I understand it sufficiently, where you agree that I understand it, <clears throat> then we can really have a meaningful discussion. Uh, if I could change presidential debates from here on out, that's what I would say. Agreed. Your first half hour, you have to articulate your opponent's positions in such a way that they agree with you. <laughs> Yes. Um, but, um, so as I began to learn about the Catholic church through the radio, I was like, okay, it's great. I'm a pastor. I, I've got some ex former Catholics in my church and it helps me understand them. Uh, many things I learned things. Oh, I'm familiar with that. Other things that I was unlearning on, you know, whether it was, uh, how to understand or explain to Marian doctor, whether I agreed with it or not, was at least kind of purifying the errors along the way. Um, but they kept doing one thing in particular that was totally new to me and was nowhere on my radar. They kept uh, talking about these, what I considered must be secret Vatican documents that substantiated their, uh, their historical basis for their beliefs. I'm like, where do you find these? And these guys were the early church fathers. Now, I later learned they're not secret Vatican documents. And pretty much the rest of the entire world already knew about these guys, except me. <laughs> and a lot of guys in my denomination. Um, because one of the things about Pentecostalism is it's, um, it's uniquely ahistorical. In that uh, Jesus, apostles, Acts 2, descent of the Holy Spirit, and then today. Okay. Whatever else happened in between may be interesting, but largely irrelevant. Uh, because, and, and part of that is an evangelistic push that, listen, people are hurting, they're broken, they're suffering. They need to have an encounter with Christ now and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's go. So there's some truth. You know, we got to engage people now, but because of that ahistorical bent, um, it, um, it just left a lot of guys like myself with just no examination of history of Christian history. Um, although it was interesting, the school I went to, uh, for my my uh, my ministry training, my theological degree, bachelor's, was a Mennonite school. Uh, so I had Mennonite profs. So there was a bunch of us charismatic Pentecostals at a Mennonite school. <laughs> yeah. And they would ask us questions like, so 
if you don't feel God, can you still be saved? You know, we're like, what? Who could ever do that? How is that possible? All of those excited Pentecostals. <laughs> and um, so, uh, so they, this, the Catholic radio would just keep talking about these church fathers that I literally had no clue of. And, uh, and so they would, they would make their biblical case for something, baptism, church, a sacrament, faith and works. And then they would say, well, here's how this is evidenced in Ignatius or Justin or Polycarp, all these guys in the first century or second century or third century. And then they would make the claim that some of these guys knew the apostles or some of them even were ordained, had hands laid on them by the apostles. And that just was mind blow for me. I'm thinking, wait a minute. What do you mean there's people that knew the apostles that also wrote stuff down that sounds interesting. I think I would like to read those guys. And, uh, and then they would quote these guys. And some of these quotes sounded pretty powerful in support of their position. I'm thinking being a context guy, well, I'm going to go track that down. So finally, um, I discovered an online resource, and there's many now with the, the, the bird, you know, this is back in 99, where this is starting. So internet was in its infancy. Um, but it's um, Christian Classics Ethereal Library. Have you heard of that one? No. CCEL.org. Okay. Absolute treasure. Everybody should go check out CCEL.org. It's not a Catholic site, which was really important because the moment I click on a Catholic site, I presume it's skewed. You know, uh, <laughs> that's that's the presumption because they've got a vested interest in Kind of reeling me in, but ccel.org, Christian Classics Ethereal Library, uh, it's one stop shopping. They've really made it a, a, their mission to um, have this online library of everything that has happened in Christianity. So I discovered there all of the texts of the early church fathers that I could read, I could search, I could download my own text file, the whole thing, just click, done. Martin Luther, Calvin, Institutes Christian Religion, his Catechism, John wow. Edwards. I mean, it was it was one stop shopping uh, for all kinds of referencing, cross referencing, and um, so once I found these church fathers online, I said, okay, I wanna I wanna read these guys in context because I'm sure once I get there, it's not really going to say what what they say they say. So I just made a list. Didache, Clement, Ignatius. So I just kind of stuck my eyes on. I'm just going to start reading through these guys and, um, and then looking up the source material that they were presenting. And, um, and that's where it really began to get compelling. And because so many times when I got to that source material of, you know, here's the biblical case. Now here's, here, here's this evidence in history so many times it was even more clear once I got to the context or it made the case even stronger as opposed to this is definitely not an out of context statement it's definitely in context and uh, so it was it was just an amazing amazing discovery at no time I can't under, underscore this enough at no time did I had ever consider or think that I would ever end up Catholic during any of this study and inquiry it was never remotely interesting. It was just curious from kind of a historical standpoint. And so that leads up to, that's a number of years there, just kind of slowly but surely learning, engaging a lot with Catholic radio. And, uh, and what's great about radio is it's just such an easy place to listen in your car. And, um, and, and just to kind of, the, the, the way I call it is like, you know, you, you, you go to the river and pick up a rock, it's all smooth. And uh, it just kind of slowly happens over time. It didn't start that way. And the radio, Catholic radio was kind of like that. It was able to just kind of slowly, gently over time, uh, knock off some of those edges. So this leads up to the summer of 2003, uh, where I go to speak at a Foursquare summer camp. And I, it's in Idaho. So I'm forever indebted to Idaho. Um, and um, so there was a camp up there that one of the, area of Foursquare churches from Boise was um, doing their summer camp. So I was speaking for the week. So I get to this camp 
And um, there's a guy that runs the camp, kind of runs in these charismatic circles as well. And he says, hey, Drake, I think uh, the Lord has something he wants me to share with you this week. I said, super. If you got it, I want it. So we go to his office and uh, we pray for a bit. And so he says, well, I just kind of have this picture in my mind of, um, uh, of your family standing on a seashore. My wife and kids are all at this camp with us standing on a seashore and, uh, and out on the ocean is uh, a big, huge ocean liner. I'm thinking, this is my kind of prophetic word. We're getting a cruise, name it and claim it. This is good. <laughs> I'm ready. And then he says, on the side of the ship says, the Queen Mary. Now, I'm not Catholicized enough yet to think of the Blessed Mother. Sure. I'm, I'm from California. I'm thinking there's that giant boat docked in California yeah, no, called yeah. the Queen Mary. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm thinking, okay, Queen Mary, boat, cruise, whatever. And so then he looks right at me and says, Drake, maybe you're supposed to have something to do with the Catholic Church. <laughs> so I get a Marian vision from a Protestant minister at a Pentecostal camp. <laughs> So I say, so then I kind of just tell him everything I've been reading and learning and studying and whatnot. And I hadn't really talked to anybody. My wife knew I would listen to stuff, but I'd listen to all kinds of stuff. Again, I'd invite the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses. So listen to Catholic radio, no big deal. And um, so I tell him everything. He says, wow, it's interesting. So I leave that camp totally invigorated. And I, I, I really ramp up my study um, with this in mind. Wow, the Lord is going to use me to study the Catholic faith so that I can bring Catholics out of the Catholic church into the fullness of the four square faith. And, uh, um, because in fact, Pentecostals, um, and, uh, with, with your, your background being in the, some of those groups as well, um, they kind of view themselves as the cat within the Protestant world. They kind of view themselves as the Catholics of the Protestants, meaning they call themselves the full gospel. They have the fullness of the gospel. Unlike Baptist, a lot of gospel, Calvinist, uh, some gospel, you know, so, but they always viewed themselves as like, no, we've got the full tilt deal. And um, so I'm thinking, sweet, man, the Lord's going to do something. So that next year, I really ramp up my studies and uh, make it a little more systematic. And, um, and time and time again, um, it was just unsettling because the Catholics could make a biblical case, and I could make a biblical case, yeah. pick our topic, whatever it might be. Here's their take, here's my take. We're both a scripture. But then the next piece, and this, this I can't underscore enough, really began, began to be a, uh, just really fixated in my mind, was where do our respective beliefs appear on the timeline of Christian history? Sure. So I've got my four square right now. So, and I knew my denomination didn't start until the 1920s or 1917. Um, but I understood the, our beliefs went back further. Um, but um, so, but where did my view of communion, of baptism, of salvation, of grace, faith, works, church, all of that, where does, where does that appear on the timeline of history? Where, and the, and the Catholics, where does that appear on the timeline of history? Because now that I've been introduced to these early church fathers, and you've got things like, the Didache, one of the earliest, if not the earliest Christian document that, that shows uh, order of worship, a bit on the moral life. Um, it's really interesting. It, it talks about how to, how to, how to <laughs> treat itinerant ministers. It does say if they ask for money, they're a false prophet, throw them out. Is that uh, right? I did not know that. Wow. Yeah. It's really interesting. It says if they stay, they can stay for one day, maybe two. If they stay for a third, they're a false prophet, send them back in. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but in the Clement of Rome, 80, 85 AD, ordained by Peter, and then you got Ignatius of Antioch, and, and the Shepherd of Hermas, and yeah. Justin Martyr, and Polycarp, and, and, uh, and so that question, where do my beliefs appear on the timeline of history, um, began to really be an unsettling question, because I'm all in on Jesus, I'm all in on the gospel, and but if, if my beliefs begin, my particular beliefs, so, and I guess I should pause and say that for the most part, 
between Catholics and the vast majority of 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 Christians of most other every other stripe, we have far more in common than we ha than we have separate. Yeah, I mean, there was no dis no difference on the Trinity, the incarnation, you know, the nature of God, and uh, and most things. There, there was a lot even similar in regards to the work of Christ on the cross and and that uh, atoning sacrifice. And there's there's some real theological differences there, but but in practice, we we got to share the gospel. We want to live holy lives. And we should worship God, you know. So there was a lot of things in common, um, you know. The specifics are, are obviously, you know, very different. But so the um, this question of history. So I began to. I just I chose to kind of pick a topic. Uh, I chose water baptism because that that was something that was uh, number one. I believed in baptism. And so I didn't like I didn't just jump to the Eucharist because I, I didn't really wrap my mind yet around real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. But baptism we practice and the Catholics practice. But what they believe about baptism is different, that it's uh, so my denomination symbol. Catholics no, this is actually uh, a regenerative, uh, regenerative moment. It's 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 the moment of objective being placed in Christ and receiving grace. That's it's not the totality of when salvation begins. It actually begins before that, the whole rites of initiation for um, uh, for the RCA process for the catechumen are really beautiful, and all of what they say takes place, reality and spirituality in us prior to baptism. It's really powerful, um, but that water baptism is the objective moment that we now consider ourselves a Christian. Anyway, so I began. So I just went from zero to two hundred, a little bit up to three hundred, and and made just a systematic study of every church father that had anything to do with what does anything to say, what does baptism do? Not just that they did it, but what does it in fact do? And, uh, uh, and I went up to 300 because uh, there's a lot of disagreement amongst Protestant brothers and sisters, but one of their primary points of agreement is um, that everything went off the rails at Constantine. Like he's the guy that ruined it. Um, and uh, so I figured out if there's a Catholic church, it should be evidence before Constantine. So I, I limited my study to that time period. And um, so, uh, and as I read through the fathers, 100%. And I mean, I, I, I wrote this super long, way too detailed 40 page paper on water baptism, all the scripture citations, all the church father citations, um, and what they say it is, and then went through my four square understanding. And, and when I started this, I didn't really start with the conclusion. I honestly went in to say, I want to see where this goes. And, um, and in the end, it was really overwhelming. And in the end, I ended up making this, I made this map and um, had the whole kind of the Roman era at the time. And then I, I put all these church fathers and all the different locations and the dates of when they write. And um, to show that this understanding of water baptism is biblical and super early historical. And, and, it, and it finally led me to this, this final conclusion. People usually, um, well, I won't go there. Um, this really unsettling conclusion that either Christianity is Catholicism or there is no Christianity because there was no other genuine answer to what was going on in 100, 200, 300 AD other than Catholicism. Now, some things are in seed form. Not everything is fully flushed out as we know it today. Yeah. But, um, and, and in the end, the Pentecostal view of the early Pentecostals and many other groups, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, various others, um, had this view of the great apostasy. There was a true church and then it left and then was restored by pick your reformer, Martin Luther, Mary Baker, Eddie, whatever. And in the end, it was one of two things. Either it's a conspiracy theory of the church suddenly overnight disappearing, or it is in fact what the Catholics say it is. And the reason why I say conspiracy theory, because you've got this biblical case and you've got genuinely with this topic of water baptism, 100% agreement of every Christian writer of what it is doing. 
And when you look at the geographical region and to see this uniformity in writing, you would have to somehow change everybody's theology in an amazingly broad geographical region when there's no internet, telephone, mass mail system, and they somehow reasonably uniformly do this all together and have the same conclusion, which is now false yeah. in such an unbelievably, unbelievably short period of time that it's just, there's no practical way with any human experience that we know that that could happen. And you've got from France and Rome and Italy and Africa and Jerusalem and just the whole region. And, um, and it was a mind blow. And then to add to that, my symbolic baptism, when I tracked that down, there's so much here and I'll just try and keep it succinct. When I finally tracked down, okay, where does my theology come from? Found Ulrich Zwingli, yep. the father of symbolism. And this just was kind of the mind blow moment where I tracked down his document where he writes about baptism and he has lots of crazy stuff. Most of the other reformers didn't like Zwingli. Um, and he literally says, I put this in my paper, that all of the fathers and doctors who ever taught about baptism before me are wrong. I will set out for you now the true teaching on baptism. It is a symbol. When I read that, I thought, you've got to be kidding me. He just pulls a rabbit out of a hat and says, here it is in 1534. Wow. And uh, so it was that whole discovery that led me to a place of leading up to that year of 2004, where there was a week where I was genuinely, this is not hyperbole, sick to my stomach for a week saying, God, don't make me become Catholic. <laughs> I'll be anything but Catholic. Lord, I've never refused you anything. Don't make me become Catholic. I did not want to become Catholic all the way up until I decided to become Catholic and even for a good time after that. Um, so all this loops back around kind of the, the end of this part of the story to the summer of 2004, I go back to that same summer camp where the guy gives me the Marian vision and I'm invited back to speak again. So I'm back in Idaho and uh, I, I get there. That guy that previous year, I'd never met him before in my life when I got to the camp. I didn't know, I hadn't talked to him all year long. I check into our room, he comes into our room and uh, knocks on the door, opens the door. He says, oh, hello, Drake. First words out of his mouth, how's the Queen Mary? I'm like, oh my goodness. By this point, we know we're going to become Catholic, but now I'm speaking at this camp. So I'm kind of internally conflicted. And I'm like, Shh, talk to me later. Uh, so I meet with him later. I tell him the whole deal. And, um, and he, he, I tell him, I'm looking for any reason not to do this. And he says, I don't have it for you. Uh, you need to go where the Lord's calling you. And uh, we left, we left um, that mass went on vacation for a bit, snuck into mass is what it felt like at Ogden, Utah for our first mass. And, um, and then eventually made our way fully at home to the church. And um, so, yeah, many more pieces. There's the journey to the priest, but I'll pause there and see if there's anything you want to you ask. Me to remind you about the beginnings of pedagogicalism. Oh, yeah. Yes. And so, in my journey to the priesthood, I had been working on a PhD that I've pretty much just set aside because uh, I want to just give my life to the ministry. And when I began formation, the bishop said, you can't do both. So, um, but what I was working on was um, Pentecostal Catholic dialogue, ecumenism, and specifically water baptism. Okay. What I discovered in all of these early Pentecostal journals was these early Pentecostals, and, and there's this fantastic online site that has all these early Pentecostals. You can read everything from 1906, 7, 8, and all these different groups, and it's really amazing. It's really inspiring. But these early Pentecostals, um, they go to great lengths to cite and they research and cite the early church fathers. No, so kidding. Clement, yeah, and Ignatius and Tertullian. And uh, they've got all these guys, and what they're doing is they're using them to give evidence that after the death of John, miracles still happened. Because the official Calvinistic Reformed theology is, doesn't happen anymore. So they cite the early church fathers to say, look, it was still happening. Gifts, prophetic, tongues, miracles, healings. And, uh, and it was really beautiful and kind of the 
part of the core of what would have been my thesis is uh, the early Pentecostals were right to look at those guys as evidence for how was the Christian community living and what were they doing? They, they were right. And they should just keep looking at the rest of what they were doing. Yeah. Because we should take those things, what they understood about the spiritual life. But it, um, it really doesn't make sense to say, well, we'll believe these early Christians for those things, or maybe choosing the books of the Bible, but reject them on everything else. Like they got that right. Yeah. That's it. Well, that's that. It's still a form, whether you're doing it in the Bible or with early church writing, you can proof text anything. Yeah. And yep. yeah, absolutely. And uh, so it's, it was, it was fascinating to see just their, their uh, frequent citations in certain groups of those early fathers. That's great. <laughs> that's great. Um, side note, I'm from Kerman, California. And when I, what? Yes. Do you know people in Kerman? Absolutely. I was from Fresno. When, how long did you live in Kerman? Till when? Well, I was in Kerman from my birth, 82 until 92. And then I was in Fresno until 2000 when I graduated from high school. And then I went up to Dude. The Yeah. And then I returned my band, to Fresno State. My, undergrad. my band did a gig in Kerman. I bet you were there. We probably go back to some. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we probably do. What years were you in Fres uh, Fresno and Kerman? So, yeah, I, I graduated um, in uh, 92 from Fresno Pacific University. And uh, and we we left in 90, uh, 95, 94, 95. So uh, years, good years to be in the Central Valley. So, yes, Kerman. Why? Wow, you don't run as many Kermanites. All right. No, no. Hopefully I'll come. You know, once I get this thing going, I'm going to hopefully hear from some of those folks that have conversion stories and, and what. <laughs> so, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think go ahead and continue the other. OK, before you do that, actually, um, what's fascinating to me in what you just said is you heard Catholic radio, you it seemingly immediately were able to dig into the early church fathers. Like you said, you're not going to become Catholic, but it doesn't sound like you resisted because I've come across a number of people now. And I have a video about this called Vincible Ignorance. What is Vincible Ignorance? Mm. That is, whoa, I, I'm aware of those writings, but they're irrelevant. And they kind of just shut them down. And I find it fascinating that even though you were not in any way thinking this was going to lead to Catholicism, you're just open to exploring it all. So, for yeah. and, and I think that there, there is something that is, is true in that, that, um, I would say it does characterize how I approach most things. And, and unfortunately, a lot of our polarized world in which we live in doesn't, where I wanted to, like inviting the Mormons over. I, 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 I want to I get to the heart of what it is that you understand. I totally disagree with it, but I at least want to be able to understand it. Of course, yeah. And, um, and go from there. And so, uh, yeah, so that was definitely made the fathers at least interesting on that standpoint. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll fast forward a little bit now to the, uh, to the priesthood end of things, because, um, some people are surprised like what you can be a Latin rite priest and married. How does that work? Um, is this just a Pope Francis thing? That liberal Pope Francis, he's just ruining everything. Um, next thing you know, who knows? And so, no, number one, it's not a Pope Francis thing. Number one is not two. I mean, it's not, it's not new. And, um, and number three, it's, uh, it's, it's not, it's not common, but it's something the church has been doing for quite some time. Um, so she doesn't do it indiscriminately, but most people are familiar with maybe an Anglican uh, minister that comes into the Catholic church and then receives what we say a dispensation from the discipline of celibacy and is able to continue in his priesthood that he started as an Anglican minister now in the Catholic church, even though he might be married and have a family. And, uh, and so a couple of things are at play that um, the, the understanding of the teaching of celibacy for the sake of the priesthood is a discipline, not a doctrine. Doctrines, non-negotiables can't change. Trinity, incarnation, nature of the church. These are disciplines, um, things the church can regulate. And uh, it's also as one of the things I let 
uh, make people aware, which sometimes they know, but they hadn't really thought through, is that the Catholic Church, in fact, has always maintained the possibility of a married priesthood. And not just a possibility, but the actual practice of a married priesthood within the Eastern Catholic rites from the beginning all the way until this day. Um, and so that's the norm in the Eastern Catholic rites is that men who are married can present themselves for priesthood. And, but the Latin rite chose to model more after Jesus and Paul, virginity for the sake of the kingdom. I, I, I would that you remain that I am. And if you get married, you're gonna have more troubles. And, and, um, and so that it was the norm in the Latin rite. And uh, so for me, I had presented myself to uh, the diaconate uh, for, our, for our, our diocese in uh, 2010. We didn't have a diaconate. Uh, that our bishop at that time, Bishop Conlon, started the first diaconate class. So we didn't have a functioning diaconate. And so, uh, at least a permanent diaconate. And so I presented myself that year. And uh, while I knew that there were guys that received dispensations and, were, uh, and had, had come into the priesthood, I really hadn't made that my focus, namely, as I entered the church, I, I had a profound sense of, I've, I've been kind of doing it my way and building my kingdom for a long time. Sure. And I just really want to submit myself to the church. But I had one other piece with that is I wanted to serve as inside the church as possible. Now, namely, I didn't want to just be some outside apostolate um, doing YouTube podcasts of uh, converts. No, <laughs> uh, uh, but I came to the church through Apostolate, Catholic Answers was radio and many other things with EWTN radio. But but I, you run into so many people that only knew bad Catholics or bad priests or bad deacons. Or, so I thought, Lord, I when, wherever I serve, I'm going to serve as much on the inside as possible. Thanks be to God for all the apostolates. We need those. But I want to be one of the guys who are actually in the building. <laughs> and when somebody meets finds an engaging faithful Catholic who's a part of the actual organization. Yep. And uh, so when the diaconate presented itself, it said, great, sign me up. So it was in that first year of aspirancy, the Holy Spirit just kept uh, just pounding me saying, you need to ask the question, you need to ask the question. And he just kept kind of hunting me down in prayer. And I kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. I finally brought it to my spiritual director and uh, fully expecting him to go, no, don't worry about this. Let's just stay the course. And um, but at every turn, it just went in the opposite direction. I brought it to him. He's like, "Oh, that's interesting. Let's talk about it." And so we talked for a while. Oh, you want me to take it to the bishop? I'm like, no, I don't think so. I'm not. So finally, we took it to the bishop. The bishop was amenable, and um, so we, he had me withdraw from the diaconate and uh, and begin the process of discernment. I'm, I'm really going to go forward with this, and so that began just a long process. Um, and we had because he then he got relocated, so we had to we were without a bishop for a while. We had to get another bishop, he had to get up to speed in the process. And there were some lower level diocesan and management that kind of were in charge of it, didn't quite know how things were working. And but from beginning to end, it was about a 10 year process for me. And um, and uh, you know, there's there's reasons it took that long, it probably could have gone quicker. But what I know is it was the Lord's perfect timing for me during that time when I after I entered the church, I came here, did my master's degree, uh, came here, studied Franciscan, got hired on at Franciscan. So I've been working here, teaching here. And uh, I was a staff position, but about half my time was teaching, but the rest of my time was administrative. So I wasn't faculty, but I was working here. And boy, and I'm working in the catechetics department. So I'm just soaking in the church's discipline and history of what does it mean to hand on the faith, the deposit of faith, non-negotiables, how do we lead people to conversion, and we get to do that with my students. And so by the time I came to my priestly formation, there's actually a letter from Rome <clears throat> that said, usually here's what we require, X, Y, Z for candidates, but Drake McAllister is a bit of an exception in that his length of time in the church, his age, and what he's been doing is not the average you know, stuff people have been doing when they present yep. themselves to priesthood. Yeah. And um, so it was green lighted all along the way. And it's one of those things where, you know, you talk to people about how do you discern the will of the Lord and you, you push on doors and he'll, he'll shut doors and open doors. And, and, and there were certain doors during this time that I kept kind of pushing on thinking, Oh, maybe I'll do this apostle, this, this, every one of those just kind of shut, 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 shut. It was like every door I even just glanced at, at the priesthood, just like swung open. <laughs> And uh, with the exception of the timeline, but really that was for my benefit. 
and um, and uh, so that uh, came. I was ordained to the diaconate in 2018, and then uh, to the priesthood in 2019. Wow. And um, uh, so I'm in. Uh, that was December 21st. So I'm in my second year of priesthood. So I'm still a newbie rookie priest. Yeah. And uh, but I do have a wife. Got five daughters and. So most people have been really great and really supportive. A few people really been out of shape and that's okay. Uh, I, and I, when I totally get that, that for some people, it's just really hard to wrap their mind around. And, um, and that's one of the things I do want to say at this point that um, I, um, I always make clear that my journey to the priesthood is not at all any personal statement or I'm not an activist to end priestly celibacy. I'm simply here to serve the Lord in the maximum way that the church allows. And if at any point during that time, they said, church said, Drake, thanks, but we say no, I would have submitted 100%. Um, part of my journey to the, to the Catholic church was really that place of surrendering my perceived authority to the authority of the church. And it's for her to confirm or deny her ministers. And so uh, every now and then somebody say, how could you do this? I said, I'm not doing anything. I mean, if you know anything about the priesthood, I can't just ordain myself. I mean, there's, there's a couple of bishops here. There's a whole bunch of trips to the CDF with documents. And I mean, the, nobody makes themselves a priest. And, uh, and my time, my, my process started under Pope Benedict and, um, and it uh, really has been uh, an amazing journey for me, for my family. And, and it's allowed me to continue in that call that I had in my early 20s, where the Lord said, Drake, give me your life, full-time service. And, um, and because that's what I had given my life to. When I entered the church, I was fully prepared for that to be done, that, you know, for me to become Catholic means you, you're fired, you lose your job. And I would have people ask me, say, Drake, why are you becoming Catholic? And I would tell them, uh, my desire is to follow Jesus Christ to the fullest extent possible. And that has led me to the Catholic Church. And, um, and it's, it's, it's a great grace. Uh, being a, a priest over this last year and a half or so has just been um, humbling. It's been amazing sitting in the uh, confessional here in confessions has been uh, just one of the greatest joys of my life, being that extension of God's grace and mercy, and uh, hopefully be a, a priest that's a little different, not just kicking out Hail Marys, but uh, giving something a little more substantive, and, and uh, so I'm, I'm, yeah, just blessed to be here, and, uh, um, and it'll be interesting to see where the, where the Lord takes me, and how this continues to work. I'm, I'm parochial vicar at our current parish. I've got a priest who's kind of mid seventies and he's uh, just a fantastic priest. I couldn't, ex I couldn't have a better pastor to serve under. And uh, he's on the older side, but he's really happy as long as I don't make messes to let me just run with stuff. So, uh, <laughs> so to that end um, it's been a really great place to serve. That's excellent. Let me ask you this. So if I understand correctly, once you went back to the early church fathers, knowing that you came from a movement that started in the 1900s, what did you make of the 15 through 1800s? I know you mentioned Zwingli, but I'm just curious. One, I mean, it sounds like you didn't have to necessarily, once you understood early church and everything you did with water baptism, that you didn't need to go mainline to mainline to mainline to understand everything that they did agree with or did not agree with. Yeah. And, and this actually raises an important point, the difference between Pentecostal Christians and Reformed Christians, like the main lines, more and more the Reformed Calvinists. So Pentecostalism, they never would have said this, but really was theologically a huge step back towards historic Christianity. And it was a huge step back towards Catholicism because Pentecostalism restored many of the things that the Reformers had left um, have rejected that Catholicism and never rejected. And so, uh, and Pentecostalism fixed some of the greatest errors of the Reformation. So uh, they rejected Calvin's doctrine of double predestination. They rejected that there is no free will. They functionally restored faith and works, no holiness of life 
matters. You, in fact, can lose your salvation. You can say yes to God. It's not limited atonement. It's so we um, grew up very much. In fact, I was probably more anti-Calvinist than I was anti-Catholic. <laughs> in fact, to be a pastor in a denomination, you had to sign basically that you reject Calvin doc Calvin's doctrine of double predestination. I you know, know, so they wanted no Calvin. So there was a lot of that that I had already rejected. Uh, as far as the reformers and some of their particular theology. And so it did send me back to digging in more to Martin Luther and Calvin to see where some of those underpinnings had come from, come through. But, um, but yeah, I didn't need to unfold all the different groups because really once I saw that for the most part, straight line from scripture and through the father's, um, that's just, it's so compelling that I largely can compare that with my tradition. And then mainly, uh, I would say the, the, the authors of Protestantism. So Luther, Calvin and Zwingli. Wow. Uh, yeah, I remember when I probably a few months after I reverted, I told my wife, it seems that the, you know, non-denominational non charismatic Pentecostal movements I kid you not, I said this, I said, it seems like there's a circle and that they are like coming around back to early church Catholicism. Yes. And I had trouble articulating it and clearly I still do, but um, there is a very real sense, um, just the people we met there near and dear. And I just find that fascinating what you just said. I, I, I couldn't make that connection. I just could sense yeah. it and I would talk to them when I would uh, discuss different things that they believe, I go back to sermons I heard. Very fascinating. So yes, yeah, yes, and uh, and there's so much there. You know, there's people spill a lot of ink on Second Vatican Council and plus and minus and this and that and fallout. Yeah. But when you go back and really read John the Twenty Third's opening speech and you read the documents of the Council, the Council was also a, a significant move to return and restore some of this ethos of those early Christian cent centuries. And uh, that's why you get the restoration of the catechumenal process for bringing people into the church, the RCA, that gets restored at that council. That was a mainstay in the early church of people when they restored that, like people are trying to get out. Nobody's trying to get in. Why are you restoring the catechumenate? But church under wisdom knowing we're, we're on the threshold of a tidal wave of secularism. Yeah we got to be prepared. Exactly. And um, so, yeah, I think in, in, you could see kind of in both communions, both communities, there is this kind of returning and rediscovering of some of these roots that have been obscured in various ways. Very good. Is there anything that you can add, not just to people that come across this because the keyword says Pentecostal or yeah. because it says now priest, married priest, all those <laughs> things. If you can just address or leave you know, some parting words for anyone that may come across this video, that would be helpful. Yeah. For my Catholic brothers and sisters, uh, I, I would just say first, uh, I'm here today because of a, a genuine, joyful witness of the faith. That's uh, The doctrine was not convincing, but that personal encounter with somebody who had a genuine faith and, and loved the Lord and was positive about that, uh, that's what brought me back. Uh, or brought me to even just listen. And, um, and for my non-Catholic brothers and sisters, be it atheist to my Protestant brothers and sisters, uh, back what I said, my desire is to follow Jesus Christ to the fullest extent possible. And when you take an honest, balanced look, um, you find that uh, the Catholic Church is in fact the historic Christian church filled with loads of imperfect people. Uh, there's a whole bunch of, you know, stories from my own life of ministry that kind of helped lay that foundation of brokenness and failures within my denomination to realize, listen, the Catholics don't have a corner on failure. Um, yeah. And to, to consider it because when you understand the fullness of the faith, uh, there is no greater joy in Jesus than being at home in the Catholic church, um, the fullness of the sacraments and in particular, the Eucharist. Excellent. Father Drake, thank you. That was beautiful. Amen. I appreciate all of your knowledge. I love what you did with the water baptism documents. That was excellent. 
Um, for those of you that listened, please share this, like it, comment. I know that that helps uh, get the word out. And if you know of any reverts or converts, send them my way to eddietrask.com. Until next time, take care and God bless. Bye. God bless.